Okay. Here is the second and last lecture summarizing your entire semester of macroeconomics. Uh, I gave you some general ideas about the instability of the macroeconomy and how the business cycle works and the uh, particular instability of, of physical investment. But, as I said earlier, the class is going to be talking about the financial capital flows. And so, as a consequence, we really need to talk about the financial sector a little bit separately. So here we go. Again, just domestic macro stuff. All right. Now, Keynes, who I'm a big fan of, which does not make me a Keynesian. If you are a graduate of Contending Perspectives, you know the difference. Uh, Keynes uh, said, in general, banks hold the key position in the transition from a lower to a higher scale of activity. So the overall level of economic activity depends critically on physical investment. But firms must borrow to undertake physical investment, and therefore, the financial sector is key in determining the overall level of economic activity. So I said nothing about the financial sector in that uh, previous lesson. And now I'm going to say, that actually, we've got to work that in now uh, because of the fact that that investment is also critically dependent on the fact that they need to get funds. They need to be able to borrow the money to invest. Right? Firms almost always are going to borrow money to invest. All right, so uh, just some data here real quick. Uh, the small business loaners uh, of America, you know, uh, who uh, has the most money loaned out, but this is um, uh, just an example of, of how banks are loaning out money to businesses to, uh, for investment. I'm not really sure why I bothered to include that back when I did, but I did. All right, the financial sector does two really important things. It provides liquidity. And that means the ability, to, the, the, the spending power that the firm needs to buy the um, investment goods that they're going to need to produce their new restaurant or whatever. And then they also, not only do they provide it, but they have to decide who gets it. All right? And that, that second one's really hard. Banks and other financial institutions not only have to provide the liquidity, but they have to provide it to the right people. Okay? Um, and they have to make sure that those who are going to be the most profitable are the ones that get the funds. And what, what I'm going to end up saying is, they're really good at that. They're hit and miss at this, and that's going to be a problem. In fact, there's some built-in tendencies that are quite negative. All right. Uh, what if I told you that banks create money out of nothing by typing numbers into a computer? And that's right. Uh, the you know providing li liquidity, which, the, which is the first of the two things I had listed there, requires the ability to create liquid assets for borrowers, and banks can do that. Now let me explain to you how banks really work. Um, I didn't learn this until maybe ten years ago. Uh, Dr. Quinn had given all these talks and stuff on the financial sector. You know how he's uh, he's all obsessed with that kind of stuff, uh, and he would show us these little you know uh, T accounts, and I would think. That sounds really important and interesting, but I don't know what the hell he's talking about. So, I dove into it more and more, and oh my God, uh, this is like a paradigm shift. Um, the way we teach banking in most economics classes is not simply a simplification of the real world, it's wrong. And it gives the wrong lesson about how financial institutions work. And I, I was reading um, something on the internet by somebody who was explaining all this, and they said, if you can't get this part, then you just don't understand macroeconomics. And I would say that there is something to that. Well, everything, but something to it. All right. So, uh, oh, when I was in seventh grade, I met at my own country called Harvania. So there it is. Um, don't know where I got the name. So we've got uh, every financial, well, every, every firm, and in fact, we could do this for you personally, have assets and liabilities. Stuff that represents you know, income or sources of income for me and stuff that represents uh, debt or, or uh, outflows for me. And a typical bank is going to have you know, financial assets like this. Like maybe I put in some treasury bills. Treasury bills are, U.S. treasury bills are almost cash. They are extremely safe, right? But very little interest. So there's very little income. I mean, I know, I know you've heard this, that there's an inverse relationship between the safety of a financial asset and the rate of return. And sure enough, on this extremely safe financial asset, there's, zero rate of uh, there's a very low rate of return. On the reserves, which is just cash, I was going to say in the vault, but really they keep it at the Fed, but you know, same idea. Um, on the cash, there's zero return. But what's the likelihood that cash is no longer cash? Well, it's still cash. 
oh my god, my dollar depreciated, it's now 90 cents. That's impossible. But your treasury bill could have that happen. Exceedingly unlikely, but it could. Uh, but a dollar's worth of reserves is a dollar's worth of reserves forever. A dollar may not be worth as much, but we're not talking about that. This is all nominal right here, right? Um, because if these appreciate, if, if inflation affects everything equally on this entire uh, chart. All right, so, um, and then, but the, really where we're making our money as the bank is on those loans. Uh, that's going to be our biggest source of income. But the problem is, you might not pay me back. So uh, the issue then becomes, um, how much of my assets do I want in loans versus treasury bills versus reserves? The worst rate of return is on the reserves, but they're perfectly safe. The second worst rate of return is on the treasury bills, but they're extremely safe. The, uh, did I say second worst? Uh, yeah, that, that was correct. The best rate of return is on the loans, but you might not pay me back. All right, so that's the big, biggest risk. All right, so think about that for a minute. Let's add up the bank's assets. Uh, the bank's assets in total are $240 million. Now, what kind of liabilities have they got? Well, the big one's probably going to be the checking. All right, uh, that's not their money. You can come in and take that out anytime you want. Uh, the, so, so that's a liability for them. That's something they owe to somebody else. They owe that money to you. Banks also borrow money. Banks borrow money from other banks, as we'll talk about here in a minute. Banks borrow money from their own customers when you open a savings account, or they could borrow it from the central bank, the Federal Reserve, but they borrow money. Now, this last one here, in a sense, in one sense really isn't a liability, but this is the difference between total assets and liabilities. The idea being that were it possible to cash in all the assets at once and pay off all the liabilities, that's what would be left. 30, uh, 30 million would be left, so that's their, that's their net worth. Uh, and I guess the one place I was reading, it said, well, you could think of it as a liability because it's what the bank owes the shareholders. That's the shareholders. The, the bank is actually owned by the people who own the, uh, who own the shares of the bank, so that's what they owe them. But yeah, either way, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. If you cashed in all of this and you paid off the 200 and the 10, you'd have 30 left, so that's their net worth. Okay, now do I go through a loaning example here? Oh, I do. Good, 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 good. All right. Now, um, that's how the bank's set up. The next question is going to be, how does the bank extend a loan? And I'm going to move my chair around here because on the monitor that I'm watching right now, it has all kinds of extra symbols on there, like what it's focusing in on and crap like that. And it's over top of my slides. So I'm going to move a little bit. Uh, let's see. Have you begged with us before? <laughs> all right. So let's say Bob comes in. To this bank and wants to borrow 10 million to open a pizza place all right and so they're going to present the bank with a, a, a business plan and you have to impress this person sufficiently with the business plan to make them extend the loan and they're going to plug a bunch of numbers into a computer you know uh, how long have you been at this job how you know did you get a college degree all that kind of crap uh, to decide whether or not they're going to loan the money to you let's say that the loan arranger, uh, loan arranger, uh, decides that's a hell of an idea. Now, don't forget, their main source of income is the loans, so they want to loan you the money. And if they think you're a good deal, they really, really want to loan you the money. All right, so they say, no problem, we'll give you a ten million dollar loan. And so they add that to their loans down here. I have it italicized because the number has changed. It was one sixty, and now it is. 170, all right? So they went up by 70. Notice also, now their assets went up to 250 in total. But the question becomes, how do they extend? Now, where do they go to get that money? Where do they come up with that $10 million? Who do they ask for the $10 million in order to extend the loan? Absolutely no one. Banks are permitted by law to just make up an account on the computer that's worth $10 million and hand you a checkbook and say, okay, Bob, Here's a $10 million account. Have fun. All right? But you better dang well pay us back. Um, but have fun. All right? The only legal requirement is that they have to keep 10% of all checking, which is the rule, actually, 10% of all checking in reserve. So they're going to have to address that problem here in just a minute. But, but in the meantime, I want to point out to you that they, are, that they are extending credit is what they are doing. They aren't doing anything remarkably different, or markedly different, I should say, than, I don't know if you've seen an old Western movie, you know, or something like that, where 
somebody, uh, some farmer comes in to the general store and says, uh, and it's all male dominated, of course, so I'll use all male names here. Um, hey, Tom. That's the way they talked back then. Hey, Tom. Uh, I need to get me $50 worth of, uh, uh, of seed to plant my corn this year, but I can't pay you yet. I can't pay you until after I've grown the corn and, and, and sold it and, and whatnot. They used whatnot a lot back then, too. Um, and I forgot who I said the store owner was. Uh, Tom? I think it was Tom. Uh, Tom says, well, that's all right, Bob. I know you're good for it. I just need you to sign this here IOU. All right. I'm going to make up an IOU here. I-O-U. That's a terrible pen, John. $50. And let's say the guy is an illiterate who signs it with an X because that saved me some time. All right. So there's an IOU of $50 signed right there. And then, you know, uh, some arrangement on when this IOU must be paid back. But you owe the store owner. All right. Now, where was the savings there? Nowhere, right? They just wrote up on a sheet of paper. Now think about this. This sheet of paper is now money. Everybody who trusts Farmer Bob will accept this as $50. If you don't know about Farmer Bob and don't, don't, don't trust him, maybe you'll accept it as $45. You'll discount it. But as long as people have trust in the system, you can just make up money. And that's what we just did in this exchange right here. This IOU that came from nowhere can now be passed all around this western town from one individual to another as if it were a $50 bill. And it, um, or, you know, 45 or whatever our level of uh, confidence in, in, in Farmer uh, Bob is. Um, and in fact, even if Farmer Bob eventually defaults, it was still money that whole time. That's what a bank does. We, we now no longer require the merchant to do this. Right, the merchant doesn't have to extend the loan. The bank does it instead. And the bank is just writing an IOU is all they're doing. Uh, and that hopefully one day... Now, you never even really need any money in this transaction, right? Other than these IOUs. Because once Farmer Bob um, has the corn, Farmer Bob could theoretically sell the corn to the general store for $50 that the general store could then sell to other people. So all we did was exchange corn for this which we then tear in half. So credit money, credit money comes out of nowhere. And that is, uh, I, I saw a study by a guy, God, what's his name? I forgot it right now. Um, uh, on the English banking system where he estimated like 95% of every pound in Britain was because someone extended a loan. All right. So huge process here. We just make it up. Now, uh, uh oh, we don't have enough reserves now. Well, the bank has a couple of choices. First of all, they've got 14 days to make good on this. And by the way, where this is going is, where this whole thing is going is with respect to international economics is that the financial sector has certain instabilities that are important to us in international economics, given that the exchange market is going to be driven by international financial flows. So these instabilities in the financial flows are important. The instabilities in the financial institutions are important to understand as background. All right, so anyway, where are they going to get the, the, the extra... Um, they need an extra million dollars in reserves. You're supposed to keep 10% of all checking in reserve. Well, now we've got the 210. Well, first of all, we've got 14 days to make good on this. All right, that's the, that, that's the U.S. law. 14 days to make good on it. Uh, and if I really think this joker here is a great, a great um, what do you call it, risk, then I'm making a loan. I don't want you to walk out that door and go to one of my competitors. Uh, I don't care whether we've got enough reserves or not. We're allowed to be short of reserves. All right? So we're going to be short of reserves tonight. Now, there are a couple of places we can get those extra reserves. As I say, you know, within 14 days, we could borrow them from another bank. That's probably going to be the first thing we do. You've heard of the federal, federal funds market, right? The federal funds market is the, is the market for reserves. If your bank has excess reserves at the end of the day, you're not going to make any money, right? So what you do is you advertise online, and we've got excess reserves. Does anybody run short? And if somebody runs short, they borrow the money overnight is all they borrow it. So the next morning you get the money back plus interest. Uh, so they could just borrow it on the federal funds market from other banks that had excess reserves. And then they can plug it in down here, and wham, they've, they've covered it. So uh, one source of reserves when you run short, like that bank did, is other banks. But 
Let's take the second situation down here. What if the entire macro economy is expanding all at once? So lots of banks are short of reserves. The banking system is net short of reserves. There aren't enough reserves to satisfy everybody. Okay, now you're the chair of the Federal Reserve. And you know that the banking system is short of reserves. And oh, man, I wish this was an interactive class. I, I love doing this because students always work it out as, as we go along. They, they figure out the answer piece by piece. What does the Fed target? What economic variable does the Fed target in real life? They target interest rates. They set an interest rate target and they keep it there sometimes for months, sometimes for years. They keep their interest rate target in the same spot. And they're targeting the interest rate for these funds, the federal funds market. They're targeting that, all right? So if they believe that the entire banking system is short of reserves, then they know what's going to happen next. Interest rates are going to go up because those banks are going to compete among themselves for those reserves and drive up the cost of those reserves, drive up the interest rate. Well, you don't want that. You're the Fed, and you don't want the interest rate to go up. You haven't changed your, I mean, if you've changed your target, that's one thing. But if you haven't changed your target, which is 99% of the time the case, then what you want to do is you want to supply the funds. You want to supply those funds. And how do you do that? You buy treasury bills. You buy a million dollars worth of treasury bills from that bank, and now they're at 21. This was 60, and that was 20. Now that's 59, and that's 21. So when the entire system is short of reserves, if the Fed is still targeting the same interest rate, they're all but obligated to provide the missing reserves. And they do so by buying treasury bills right there. So the bottom line here is the bank was never constrained, as I always taught and was, and was taught, the bank was never constrained by that initial number on reserves. That initial number on reserves Screw that. We'll get the reserves. Uh, and now, is it, is it possible for a bank to not get them? Yes, it is. I mean, in, in you know, times of crisis or if you have a crappy bank or whatever. But in general, banks don't worry about reserves. They loan and they figure out the reserves later. And if the um, entire system is short of reserves, the Fed provides the reserves. So banks are not reserve constrained, which is what I was taught they were back when I was in school and what I taught for many years. Um, okay, do I have that part next? No, I don't. Um, what I do want to show you here that I didn't highlight, but I do in the article you have to read, is the really important number here. Let's back up to the first one. The really important number here, and the place where they are constrained, is the capital to asset ratio. The ratio of net worth to total assets, or 30 divided by uh, 24, which I believe is for some reason is 12 percent. I don't know, I've done this example so many times now I can't remember what it is. Uh, let's see. There's Dr. Scott's message about the disaster in baseball. Um, calculator. Oh, wait, let's clear everything. 30 divided by 240, 12.5 percent. 12.5 percent. All right. So 30 divided by 240 is 12.5 percent. You know what that means? That means that these numbers up here can fall by as much as 12.5% before that goes to zero. And when that number goes to zero or negative, that's when Federal Reserve officers show up at your door and escort you to a minimum security prison or something like that. It's when you get in trouble. Um, which, by the way, as a side issue, Dr. Quinn says, in Japan, banks are allowed to have negative net worth. Hey, you're still operating, right? But in the U.S., they're not. Financial institution with zero or negative net worth has to shut down. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have to get to zero. As you can imagine, as it approaches that, then you're going to start to get federal regulators showing up at your institution. So, once again, the really key number here, and the number that really is constraining on a bank, is the ratio of the 30 to the 240. All right? Now, check out what happened. We started at 12.5%. It's at 12.5% now. Look what happened after the loan was made. Now it's 30 to 251, or in this example, depending on how you get the reserves, um, I'm sorry, 30 to 251 or 30 to 250, either way, the ratio has gone down. The, the net worth stayed exactly the same. So how far they were from insolvency did not change. But 30 divided by 250, that's the 12%, that's the 12%, right? So. 
As banks make loans, they are lowering the asset to, I'm sorry, the, the uh, net worth to asset ratio or the capital to asset ratio as it's, as it's also known. As they make more loans, the capital to asset ratio will decline. And unfortunately, there's a huge incentive to make loans because that's the big money maker, right? So you want to make loans. But that means that you want to engage in activities that lower the financial stability of your institution. Because the smaller the capital to asset ratio, the closer you are to bankruptcy in the event of a depreciation of any of these. So now the, the treasury bills are safe, the reserves are safe, but what if people start not repaying the loans? You know how much your loans can go down? By 30 million. And then you're at zero over here. If 30 million worth of loans go bad, then that goes to zero. So that's what you have to worry about. The more loans you make, the more... And notice, as I make more loans, that still stays at 30. Because as I make a loan, that goes up by 10, for example, uh, and that goes up by 10, for example. We're going to have to do a little shifting, of course, for the reserves. But roughly speaking, as you... And the, the, the net worst is exactly the same. So I can jack this sucker here way up but that's still 30. And it's very tempting, especially during an economic expansion when everything seems to be going right, to make more and more loans. This is why, after the financial crisis, the Fed did not change the reserve ratio. Banks still had to keep 10% of checking in reserve. They didn't change that, because that wasn't part of the problem. They did change the required uh, capital to asset ratio. They did change the required net worth to asset ratio because banks were being too dangerous. Uh, they were doing a couple of things. Um, and what did they change it to? Well, it's complicated because the formula ha uh, puts different weights on each of these. And, and you know, but, but the point is, they made it higher. You have to maintain a higher capital to asset ratio since the financial crisis than before the financial crisis. And one more point I want to make before I leave this right here is that... Um, Lehman Brothers, who went bankrupt, their capital to asset ratio was like 4.5%. So they were 4.5% away. Depreciation of these things over here. And they had um, things like subprime derivatives over here. They had a much wider range of, of financial assets over here and things that were traded on the stock market. They were 4.5% away from bankruptcy. And the stock market lost 20% in a week back during the financial crisis, they were extremely close to financial bankruptcy, uh, to, to insolvency, um, before anything happened. So that's the number we need to look at. And so notice what I've said here, that this, this, this capital asset ratio is, is the real key to the viability of financial institutions, and there is a built-in incentive to lower it. Because as, as you take on, for example, loans, that doesn't change but the assets go up, uh, and so the ratio, the percent by which the assets have to fall, keeps going down. Uh, so that's very dangerous. Uh, another factor that you can add on top of that during the financial crisis was the fact that the Fed wasn't really regulating. Uh, they were taking the bank's word for how risky these assets were. For example, uh, well, and especially the new ones. The, uh, I shouldn't say that. The, the established ones, fair enough, they all had a formula. But for things like subprime derivatives, the banks were arguing, oh, these are really safe. Well, they weren't. Um, so they weren't enforcing their own rules, uh, and they were allowing these ratios. Well, and plus banks were trying to hide things. There's a built-in incentive to want to hide. And if the Fed doesn't actively check, you're not going to tell them. You don't want people to know you've taken over, you've taken on risky assets that you hope will pay off really big, but you don't want them to know that. Lots of problems. Okay. Now, that was the issue of can, can they provide liquidity? Oh, yeah. At the drop of a hat, I can come up with more money for the macro economy. At the drop of a hat, I can raise this loans number, right? Um, there are limitations, but it is easy for financial institutions to provide funding. What about the second goal I said, or the second task I said? That was allocating, sending it to the right people. This requires a reasonably accurate pricing of financial assets and the evaluation of default risk. All right, so making sure the right people get money, uh, making sure that you have the right assets in your portfolio requires some reasonable amount of accuracy in your forecasting. Now, let's see, reasonable pricing, I already said that. 
It's just a funny joke. Do you have any other collateral besides this email from a Nigerian prince? <laughs> All right. The ideal situation would be that asset price, take, take a stock price, for example. Think of a stock price. That asset price is a stock price is based on the fundamentals where the fundamentals are those factors directly relevant to the asset issuer's long-term profitability. Things like industry market conditions, their plans for the future, relevant government regulations, effectiveness of the management team, labor issues, on and on and on. All right, so if prices are derivative of these things down here, that's a good thing. Hopefully, those asset prices will be more accurate, a more accurate representation of which undertakings are risky, which ones are safe, which ones are profitable and which ones are not, all right? If these things are the factors playing into the prices. Market participants need to have a reasonably clear and stable view of these fundamentals, all right? Uh, you already know this, right? The problem is that they are subject to the same problem of uncertainty, the financial institutions are, as the firms who are uh, investing. The same problem of uncertainty. We don't have all the information, all right? We don't know all the odds. So it's a scary world out there. We never have all this information. So this just goes through and does the whole, you know, thing I just did a minute ago. Um, now, financial crisis. Paul Krugman said, yeah, we came to believe that stocks and other asset prices were always priced just right. Why? Well, according to Keynes, it would be because they were using this deal where we knew everything. Economists, financial economists, were building models based on risk and not on uncertainty, where we knew everything. And as, as, as a Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman says, after um, the financial crisis, he says, well, we kind of just assumed they were right. We kind of assumed that the prices and the evaluations were correct. Um, okay, I'll, I'll pause there for a second for you to read a funny joke. Okay. Um, and then I go through the example that you already know, uh, that... Um, this issue of uh, we never have all the information. Let's see. And this is just explaining further about the same thing. Uh, risk versus uncertainty. Uh, again, I just went over this. Under risk tends to be very stable, uh, but behavior under uncertainty tends to be very volatile. As all the uh, agents may swing between overconfidence and panic. And so, um, even if market participants are somewhat volatile, can they at least rely on them using the fundamental inputs? Okay, so here's the question. All right, fair enough. The financial sector is also subject to that same problem of uncertainty, but hey, at least they're looking at these things, right? At least their, 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 their fundamental uncertainty is circulated around these things right here, so that would be a good thing. I mean, we can't get better than uncertainty because that's just the way the world is. We can't undo uncertainty. We can't cause us to all know all probable future outcomes and their likelihoods. That, that, that's not going to happen. But we can focus on the issues that are most relevant specifically to the firm in question, like a share of stock for Walmart. What are the market conditions for department store, or whatever you call them, uh, uh, Walmart store, yeah, and you know, Target, that sort of thing. What's Walmart's future plans? What government regulations affect Walmart on down the road? At least people are focusing on that, right? Well, no, not really. Um, because... Uh, you know, we have the additional problem of, let's see, yeah, yeah very funny. I, I put a lot of jokes in. Um, I, I, oh, whoops. Um, I'm also pointing out the whole thing in there. Well, okay, let me stop here. And, uh, hang on. Am I going to do that too? Nope. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so I don't, I started to go further than I needed to right now. So, um, all right. So, uh, this is what I was pointing out earlier as well. Not only are we not necessarily focusing on these issues over here, but we're also all very well aware, all of us participating in this financial market, that the prices are derivative of our combined opinions. If all of us believe that Walmart's going to appreciate, you know what's going to happen? Walmart's going to appreciate because we're all going to act on our forecast by Walmart and it will appreciate. And I'm very well aware of that as, a, as an actor in this market. So yes, I'm going to look at these things, but what I'm really worried about is not as much how the labor issues will affect Walmart, but how the labor issues will affect people's perception of Walmart. And that's not always the same thing. Some of these are more um, dramatic and short term and therefore really less important, but those really move the market. All right, and we're going to get into uh, the psychology of decision making later, but what I'm trying to set up right now is that 
The game in the financial market is to guess what everyone else is guessing. All right. Uh, Keynes described it as they used to have this thing in, in, I guess, in British newspapers where they would show you, here's pictures of 10 people, which seems pretty cruel, rate them in order of attractiveness. And then you would send in your, your, your guess. The, the game was to have your ranking be the most like the average ranking. So you're trying to guess what everyone else is guessing. Keynes says that's the way stock market works. You're trying to guess what everyone else is guessing. Uh, and that turns out to be a simpler job than looking at all this. So let's see here. Now, uh, I always like to, to, to finish off with this right here. Uh, you know, Keynes is going through all this, saying how volatile it all is, and that sort of thing. And look, you know, I'm not saying everything is 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 waves of irrational psychology. On the other hand, uh, the you know state of expectations often steady, and when it's not, other factors have compensating effects. We are merely reminding ourselves that human decisions affecting the future, whether personal, political, or economic, cannot depend on strict mathematical expectation. What he means by there is, it's uncertainty, it's not risk. And since the basis for making such calc oh, uh, since the basis for making such calculations does not exist, that's what I said a minute ago, like we can't magically make the world risky instead of uncertain. We simply don't have the information. It is our innate urge to activity which makes the wheels go round. That's that animal spirits. Our rational selves choosing between alternatives as best we're able, that's when you get rid of the 20-sided die, uh, when you know there's an eight or a six-sided there instead, calculating where we can but often falling back on our motive for whim or sentiment or chance. So once again, the idea that we have a um, unstable financial system, right? Uh, with, you know, I mean, it, 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 there are long periods of stability, but now we come to this. Stability creates instability, is what Minsky said. He said that agents take on debt with an eye towards their ability to repay, obviously. And, uh, oh, that should say hedge, actually, not hence, I misspelled that. And I'm not going to go through all that there, we're never going to use it again, but the point is this, as people make, uh, as people feel safer, so they tend to borrow a higher amount of money relative to their income, and banks are okay with it, because, hey, the economy's going great. So the stable economies create unstable financial sectors. Stable economies create financial sectors that have very low capital to asset ratios, that have firms that have borrowed too much, that have households that have borrowed too much, too much relative to what? Too much relative to the uh, fact that there's going to be a recession, which is what I went over in the, in the previous lesson. There's going to be one, because investment is going to fizzle out. And unless we have some sort of system set up where the government automatically steps in, there's going to be a recession. So, um, I think that's it. <laughs> okay, oh, no, no, let me do this one too. The spectacle of modern investment markets has sometimes moved me toward, and he was a big stock market player, by the way. Um, that's his wife there, uh, some Russian ballerina, who uh, all of his other friends were like, why did he marry her? Um, she's not smart like us, but he loved the ballet, so they used to go to the ballet together. So what he did was the last time, he, he won and lost fortunes, um, and the last time he won, he quit. So I'm done. I've got enough money to go to the theater and sit in the best seats whenever I want to for the rest of my life, I'm done playing. All right, so anyway, he's, he's doing this not just from theory, but also as a practitioner, also as someone who was an active mar star market player. The spectacle of modern investment markets has sometimes moved me towards the conclusion that to make the purchase of an investment, he means financial investment, permanent and indissoluble like marriage, except by reason of death or other grave cause, might be a useful remedy for our contemporary evils. For this would force the investor to direct his mind to the long-term prospects and to those only. In other words, he's saying, what if when you bought a share of stock, you had to hold it, let's just say for 10 years? How much research would you do relative to buying a share of stock that you might sell tomorrow? That's what he's getting on at. He's getting on at this ability to resell tomorrow. People are just focusing on psychology which we're going to go into in detail here before too long. They're focusing on the psychology. They're not focusing on the actual asset issuer. They're focusing on what people think about the actual asset issuer. And it's a big, he's, he calls it a game of musical chairs. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not. It's a very cruel game to play with children. Um, you set out six chairs and seven kids. 
and you put on some music and the kids walk around the chairs and then you turn off the music and everyone has to sit down but of course one poor kid's not going to get a chair that's we call that the loser right so then that kid has to leave then they pull out another chair uh and then they keep doing it until there's one kid left and so Keynes is saying look we all know what's going to happen we're just trying to be the one we're just trying not to be the one who doesn't get a chair uh and so we're playing a game and you don't need to see that okay uh, so that's the financial institution stuff that I wanted to cover. Uh, that's, that, that's basically our entire, let me look here, review. Oh no, we've got one more thing, but I already have other videos for that, so I don't have to do a new one. Yay! Um, but I will tell you about it uh, as I start off the next video. But let me stop right here.